from our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans, welcome to our Louisiana Eats podcast series, Quick Bites. I'm Poppy Tooker. Louisiana's Cajun country is easy to access from Interstate 10, where a brief off-road venture can take you into a whole new world. Author and blogger George Graham calls Acadiana home, blogging about his food adventures there weekly on AcadianaTable.com, which is also the name of his cookbook. George has been spreading the gospel of Cajun and Creole cooking by sharing stories and recipes that make its culinary heritage so unique. On this podcast, we have a virtual culinary adventure with George and learn how he developed such an enduring passion for Southwest Louisiana and its food ways. George, a big welcome to Louisiana Eats. Long overdue that we have this opportunity to sit down and talk with you. And I want to ask you, if you had to say what your Acadiana table is, tell me about your Acadiana table. Well, my Acadiana table is a, is a very colorful world uh, of Cajun and Creole uh, cooking. It's more than just cooking. It's more than just recipes. Uh, it's really uh, chock full of personality. Uh, the Cajun culture is one that's steeped in tradition and steeped in uh, food ways uh, that's unlike any other in the nation. You know, I think that Louisiana specifically and Cajun Creole people are more defined by their food uh, than anything else. Uh, and it's my privilege to tell the stories uh, of those people. Now, the name Acadiana Table, of course, springs from the blog. Tell me about the blog and how that came to be. Yeah, the blog uh, began four years ago uh, and was uh, a real uh, challenge for me to begin to write the stories uh, of the people that I had met over decades of living uh, smack dab in this uh, colorful culture. Uh, I'm from Lafayette, Louisiana, and the Acadian region uh, are all of the parishes that surround uh, this part of Louisiana. It's southwest Louisiana and very different than New Orleans style of cooking, very rural uh, in its uh, cooking style, uh, very much focused on uh, farm fresh ingredients and whatever is at hand, whatever is uh, uh, is caught or fished or, or trapped uh, or uh, brought to uh, to the table and to the kitchen uh, in in a very simple way. But it's what these cooks do with the simple ingredients that's absolutely amazing. So I began writing about it and and went live with uh, with the blog and uh, immediately attracted a very wide audience not only nationwide, but worldwide. Uh, who knew that they had crawfish in Finland? Uh, I certainly didn't, but I was getting comments from all over the world asking about these unique recipes. Your life in food begins at a very early age at your dad's 24-hour diner in Bogalusa. That's exactly right. Bogalusa uh, is just north of New Orleans, uh, right on the Mississippi border. So uh, it's about as far in Louisiana away from Cajun uh, country as you can get. Uh, you know, we grew up on uh, mashed potatoes and gravy and, and chicken fried steak and, and fried chicken. Uh, but when I uh, left there and moved to uh, Lafayette and to Acadiana in my early 20s, uh, it was my food wake up. It was an epiphany of uh, of really uh, seeing a, a different side of Louisiana, uh, and I embraced it quickly. But I did grow up in a restaurant family, and I learned it uh, at an early age, and my father taught me that it was okay for a boy to stir a pot. Uh, and that really uh, ignited my creativity in the kitchen throughout my uh, younger years, teen years, into college, and then afterwards. And I've always cooked, uh, and I've been uh, a part of a cooking family that embraces it. The kitchen was always the heart uh, of our home. I love your memory from the Acme Cafe, your dad's diner, of stirring a pot, but you're so tiny still, you're standing on a crate to be able to reach the pot. 
That is correct, yes. Uh, some very talented uh, cooks in that kitchen uh, took me under their wings at a very early age. And uh, I remember coming in after school and uh, all during the summer uh, and, and helping out in some way or, or another in the restaurant uh, kitchen and throughout the uh, the entire restaurant. But, yes, uh, stirring pots. I, I remember stirring a roux uh, uh, at, at a very early age and uh, having to, to stand on a crate uh, to be able to do that. So, you know, it's those sorts of memories that I have that uh, really are are the spice in this book that pepper it with uh, wonderful recollections that not only I have, but just as importantly as all of the people that I've met uh, in Acadiana. Well, I'm sure everybody who has any memory of the Acme Cafe is going to be thrilled that you actually share the recipe in the book for One of the things your dad's diner was famous for, the chick sandwich, C-H-I-C. So I go into this looking at it thinking, oh, it must be some kind of chicken sandwich. But it wasn't chicken at all, was it? It wasn't. And uh, probably uh, there are generations of of people from that part of the country in Washington Parish. Uh, Since 1945, my dad owned that restaurant. But the number one bestseller on the menu was the chick steak sandwich. Uh, And uh, he started the restaurant at a time where uh, getting a, a cut of beef was a little bit pricey and out of. Uh, out of the way, both from a food cost standpoint and the price you had to put on the menu. So he took a uh, pork loin uh, and ran it through a tenderizer uh, on the bias both ways, and it became this huge uh, piece of very tenderized pork uh, that he fried golden brown like like a chicken fried steak, uh, put on a sesame seed bun, slathered it with blue plate mayonnaise and with some uh, dill pickles on it, and it was an immediate hit. Uh, I venture to say there's been at least a million chick steak sandwiches sold uh, in the years that that restaurant was there. That's fantastic. And then, of course, you go on to marry your beautiful wife, Roxanne, and she has her own very special culinary roots that she shares with you that we learn about in the book. Roxanne is uh, is a born and bred Cajun from Jennings, Louisiana. Uh, there are a lot of stories uh, in in the book that focus on not only her but her mother and her grandmother, uh, who grew up in the uh, area around Kinder and Kings Farm, uh, Fontenot family, a very proud family that farmed, a sharecropping family that uh, canned and preserved uh, anything and everything that they grew, uh, and there's so many wonderful. Uh, recipes and stories behind the recipes uh, that come from her side of the family. But my wife has a real special skill set, and uh, she is what I call the Rue Queen. And her wooden <laughs> spoon is her scepter, and she rules the kitchen whenever a Rue is to be made. I don't come anywhere near the kitchen on that particular time frame. Well, the cast iron pot and the rue spoon that came from her grandmother, you describe as being her dowry. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. And she's proud of it. And believe me, she looks at it as more valuable than anything that money could buy. Uh, and we still cook in that pot that's probably been around for a good 75 years. Uh, but she uh, can make a deep, dark, rich roux, uh, dark Hershey bar chocolate dark uh, roux that uh, really defines uh, the heart of Cajun cooking. Well, Rocks is Roux. It's worth the book just to get that complete instructional guide. You did such a great job with that. And, of course, everything starts first you make a roux. So if you can't do that, you just better give up right now. Yes, most people think that the, the prime ingredients for roux is flour and oil. Uh, but my wife's quick to say that it's patience and passion. Uh, and that's what she puts in every pot of roux she makes. Cast iron figures largely in your life. Tell us about your cast iron collection and what cast iron means to you all. 
Yeah, my, my wife, I wish you were here to answer that question because I'm constantly bringing in uh, cast iron pots that I uh, find in the back of a, a vintage flea market, uh, uh, antique store, whatever it happens to be, and they're usually rust laden. Uh, and I bring them in and she takes them in like orphans uh, <laughs> and just nurses them back to health, uh, takes the salt and, uh, and, and rubs them until all the rust is gone and she seasons them and oils them and she treats them with the same uh, care that uh, a mother of a newborn would would treat uh, a baby. And uh, she's just uh, miraculous in the way that she takes care of those pots uh, and then stirs a great roux in every one of them. Your book and your blog give us a real trip through Cajun country. Um, Even, for instance, you take us along the Boudin Trail. Boudin is one of those mysterious uh, uh, dishes, one of those uh, transcendental dishes that define a culture. Uh, And uh, of all the places in Louisiana, uh, in Acadiana, there is a Boudin trail. Uh, There are more Boudin stops along this trail in every uh, grocery store, every convenience store, every meat market, every smokehouse has their version of uh, of Buddha, and there's more debates, there's more squabbles that go on on who has the best Buddha. It's been known to uh, to really disrupt uh, families and marriages. Uh, <laughs> even my wife Roxanne and I differ on what makes a great Buddha. Uh, but that's the beauty of that particular dish: is that uh, it's it's getting out there and experiencing them all, and beginning to really figure out what's in Buddha and to be able to define what makes a great great boudin. Well, duos Cajun Corner must make a great boudin because they get a special mention in your book along with their talent with smoked meat. Yeah, I'll never forget the f- when I pulled into the parking lot of Jean Duos's Cajun Corner uh, in the crossroads of Nuba, uh, Louisiana. Uh, when I say crossroads, it's a four-corner stop between Opelousas and Washington, Louisiana, in St. Landry Parish. Pull into the gravel parking lot, and the, and, and the dust washes over my, my truck. I get out, and there's just this uh, mix of signs. Uh, you could spend an hour just looking at all the signs live bait, uh, boudin sausage, beer, lots of beer. You walk <laughs> in the front door and there's this cacophony of, of sounds that assault your eardrums from uh, whining uh, uh, band saws, cutting uh, turkey necks, uh, listening to the crickets chirping over in, in a, a live bait box, uh, and people waiting in line to purchase uh, cracklings uh, that are sitting under uh, heat lamps. And uh, there's Jean duos uh, uh, just uh, beckoning you to come in and, and, and uh, uh, just to sample everything that you're smelling. Then he took me out to his uh, smokehouse, and and there was uh, just a rack, uh, probably two dozen uh, rabbits smoking over oak uh, wood. Uh, Just an amazing sight to behold. Uh, So I bought three or four of those and went home and made the smoked rabbit gumbo uh, with andouille sausage that was just terrific. And I've been back dozens of times. Well, you have lots of adventures that you write about in Acadiana Table, Um, It might be not for the faint of heart to read the chapter about the snapping turtles. Let's talk about cleaning a snapping turtle and the place of the snapping turtle on the Acadiana table. I was driving from Opelousas to Eunice, Louisiana, and again, signs beckoned me. Uh, and this was a little seafood market on the way out of town in Opelousas called Sebastian's West End Seafood. Uh, so I pulled over, and I always carry my camera. Uh, and so I got out just to take some exterior shots. I wasn't even sure they were open. Uh, and then the door burst open, and this uh, uh, this wonderful lady with pink uh, rubber boots on, uh, those uh, shrimper boots, but she had them in pink, uh, <laughs> 
uh, came out and said, who are you and what are you taking photos of? Uh, and I told her, and she said, come on in. So I went in, and just this place uh, is one of those seafood markets that uh, is is just a sensory overload. Uh, unlike coastal Louisiana, Opelousas is very much landlocked, uh, and a seafood market there uh, has a different kind of take. Uh, there's freshwater ponds that are growing, uh, that are raising, rather, uh, an aquaculture of catfish and uh, and of snapping turtles. Uh, a lot of it's harvested uh, from the Atchafalaya Basin, uh, where farmers and trappers will bring in uh, seafood, uh, alligators, uh, uh, and crawfish, and all of the things that define Louisiana cooking. But on this particular day, she said, bring your camera, come in the back. And there was Troy DeVille uh, in his yellow bib uh, overalls, uh, fixing to take an axe uh, to the neck of a 40-pound snapping turtle. Who was still on the hoof, we'd say. Still on the hoof and and clawing at the air. It was perfect timing, and I started uh, clicking away with my camera, uh, and off came his head, uh, and he began to dismantle this with the precision uh, of any surgeon uh, out there. Uh, It was an amazing sight to see, and I quickly understood why he had uh, the bib overalls on, because uh, one pair of cats later splattered with blood, uh, I found out how messy this is, uh, snapping turtle. But in a 40-pound snapping turtle, uh, there's about 20 pounds of wonderful turtle meat that sells for uh, $10 a pound. Uh, so this or is more. Uh, oh, absolutely. Well, they were selling it for $9.99 a pound. And that I was bought a bargain. A, I bought a pound for uh, making a turtle sauce piquant that's in the, uh, uh, it's in the book, Acadiana Table. So it was a an amazing thing to see uh, and understand where your food comes from. And I think that's one of the keys of, uh, of my wake-up call and the way that I peel back the layers of the culture uh, is that I want to shake the hand uh, of the man who, who caught the fish or, or cleaned the, the turtle. I want to uh, know who grew uh, my sweet potatoes and what variety they are. And I think that that's one of the real keys uh, to Cajun Creole cooking. Well, there's lots of exotic ingredients included in the book. Of course, alligator, which honestly isn't that exotic anymore, except you make griots with it, which sounds pretty darn good to me because I always think alligators like a cross between chicken and veal. You know, it's the other white meat. But garfish, you have a recipe for garfish cubion. If you get out in the rural area of, of Cajun country, uh, most any store, any grocery store or uh, certainly any seafood market uh, is going to have a whole section uh, with alligator gar, uh, with gar steaks, uh, which are uh, these thick slabs of, of garfish. It, it is an acquired taste, but it's one uh, that is just uh, delicious, and it's something everyone should experience. Uh, it's, it's eaten quite regularly in the rural market and in some of the restaurants and, and lunchrooms uh, along the byways of, of Cajun country, you'll see it on menus. Uh, and uh, it's it's a wonderful fish uh, to, uh, to, to cook down in a, a deep, uh, dark uh, gravy uh, spiked with uh, Creole uh, tomatoes, uh, an amazing uh, dish. Highly seasoned, uh, uh, but uh, everyone should try garfish. There are definitely two schools of thought about how you pronounce Kubion. Mm-hmm. So you say Kubion, and you have it phonetically so in right. your book, Acadiana Table. And our good friend Isaac Toops, who also hails from over in that neck of the woods, he says Kubion. Where does the rubber meet the road on this? Well, it's funny that you say that because I have a friend. His name is Ted Cuvillon with a V, and I call him Cuvillon. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a very familiar name, uh, Cuvillon, over in that part of the world. Uh, I, I say Cuvillon, and uh, that uh, I think is, is more phonetically the way most people say it. But uh, let me tell you that there are more pronunciations for more of these dishes than you would ever want to. I won't even get off into how to pronounce merleton or uh-uh. maleton or any way that uh, you could hear it in different ways, no matter where, uh, depending on where you are in Cajun country. 
But aside from the boudin stops and the sort of things you might expect over there, you make a point to mention Canatella's Grocery. What's so special about that place? There's this wonderful little community called Melville, uh, which is uh, up above in the uh, northern reaches of St. Landry Parish. And it used to be an amazing uh, community that was bustling and thriving uh, and was the ferry stop uh, across the Atchafalaya River. Uh, And it was one of the ways that you could get from Alexandria to Baton Rouge is via the ferry in Melville. Uh, Well, long ago... uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, the, they cut the ferry out. I don't know if it was state budget or whatever, but uh, there's no longer a ferry there. So this is a time capsule community uh, that I look at from the standpoint of just being this treasure trove of wonderful uh, artisans and wonderful uh, little shopkeepers and people who have been there for generations uh, that still ply their trades. There's no Walmart anywhere nearby. Uh, And these thriving local businesses are a throwback to how it used to be in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. Uh, And there's one grocery called Canatella's. Uh, Canatella's is is an Italian family. Uh, The Italians, everyone knows about how the Italians settled in New Orleans and the Sicilians came here. Uh, But uh, there are uh, many Italian families that made their way around uh, to the Atchafalaya and went up the river uh, to St. Landry Parish. And, and into this town of Melville. Uh, and uh, they make some unbelievable Italian sausage uh, and do some incredible dishes that they serve there at their grocery store. Uh, and uh, the the one that I featured was a Rosa Bianca eggplant. Uh, and it's stuffed with the Italian sausage and just an amazing dish. And uh, the Canatella family is certainly worth a stop when you're in that neck of the woods. You also talk about, you know, when we talk about grocery shopping, when we talk about where our food comes from, you share some thoughts on hunting, the gathering and hunting part of the Louisiana experience. And I particularly, I love the title of the chapter, If It Flies, It Fries. So talk to me a little bit about your view on hunting culture and what comes to our table that way. Well, you know, I'm quick to say that there are more men uh, that cook uh, per capita in the Acadiana area than anywhere else in in the nation, if not the world. Uh, And I believe that strongly from the standpoint of the the fishing culture, uh, the hunting camps, and also the oil and gas uh, industry with a a lot of uh, outdoor uh, cooking. uh, And every man uh, knows how to fire up a propane burner uh, and boil uh, crawfish or shrimp, uh, know how to uh, man a, 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 a 20-gallon pot, uh, cast iron, uh, and cook up a jambalaya. Uh, There are some very, very talented people, uh, and men specifically, uh, in Acadiana. And the duck hunting uh, culture, uh, the Pecan Island, I write a lot about. Uh, I'm not a duck hunter. Uh, I I like to go on hunts, and I shoot ducks with my uh, with my digital camera. Uh, <laughs> I have a zoom lens, uh, and I'm focusing just like they have it in their sights of their 12 gauge. I'm s- focusing it in my uh, 200 uh, millimeter lens. Uh, but once the hunting is over and the ducks are cleaned, uh, it's time to break out the pots. And uh, I just recently cooked uh, this uh, fabulous dish of. Uh, a wild teal uh, cooked down in mustard greens uh, and sweet potatoes uh, that has a flavor profile unlike anything I've ever tasted. Uh, and it came out of, of duck hunt uh, camp recipes. Uh, and there's so many great recipes that, that feature wild game uh, in the cookbook, but also uh, that are on the blog and, and uh, is, is on the dinner table. You write about cultural experiences, cultural traditions. For anyone who has never experienced it or doesn't know about it, tell us about the 5,000 egg omelet. Wow, Abbeville, Louisiana. Uh, explodes with this amazing uh, celebration in the first 
Saturday and Sunday of November of every year. Uh, it's the 5,000 eggs uh, celebration, the giant omelet uh, celebration, it's called. Uh, and it really goes back to uh, early period of France in the Napoleonic era. When the Napoleon's army was racing across France, uh, villages would turn out bringing eggs uh, to large pots and pans where omelets would be made for all of the soldiers as they went from town uh, to town. Uh, and there are two, uh, three celebrations, one in France, one in Belgium, and uh, this one in Abbeville, Louisiana. Uh, there are a parade of, uh, of chefs uh, in their white jackets and uh, tall hats that uh, parade down the middle of the town carrying baskets of eggs uh, in a, a 20-foot diameter uh, uh, pan, skillet, uh, cast iron over a uh, live fire. There's a, a fire tender that uh, uh, is in charge uh, of the fire, and they pull it back off of the fire after it's once it's hot, and, and they start layering in um, all of the ingredients and the onions, the trinity of onion, celery, and bell pepper. Uh, and then the eggs hit there, and there's Tabasco sauce, which is right down uh, the road from uh, Avery Island. Uh, and uh, even crawfish go into the to the omelet that they make. And people uh, stand in line and to taste this amazing thing. It's a beautiful celebration. But it's such an incredible tradition. And Speaking of tradition, I was I was very taken by your personal debate about the evolution of Acadiana's food and how there's this balance that you have to have between authenticity and innovation. Tell me your approach to that, because I, I have to say there's a lot of authenticity in your recipes but there's a tremendous amount of innovation. I get taken to task by traditionalists all the time in my food writing uh, about this uh, culture. Uh, there are those out there that do not want to see a change. They want to uh, just preserve uh, the traditional ways of doing things. And I think that there's uh, great honor in that and understanding the, uh, the root uh, of our culinary culture. Uh, but I also clearly understand as a student uh, of our Louisiana cooking that it has been a constant evolution uh, over centuries, over decades, and uh, we're seeing that evolution continue today. Uh, where would we be uh, without uh, the Spanish and European influences and the French influences coupled with African uh, influences? Where would we be uh, if the Sicilian uh, hadn't migrated to Louisiana and brought their, uh, their, their stuffed artichokes and their uh, muffalata sandwiches and their uh, amazing uh, Creole tomato uh, gravy, uh, where would we be now as we're looking at innovating in the future without our Vietnamese culture that is bringing our coastal communities new dishes? Uh, I went to a restaurant recently that uh, uh, the po' boy was called a banh mi sandwich. I uh, even have a, a restaurant recipe uh, for a soft shell crab bomb me uh, in the cookbook. Uh, there's so many influences that are coming out of our Hispanic uh, culture that uh, make its way across the Texas border into southwest Louisiana. Uh, and uh, those are, are dishes that uh, I love to, to commingle with our heritage of, uh, of great cooking in, in Louisiana. So, to say that nothing should change, uh, short change is where we've come from uh, over the last centuries, and uh, it would only be the evolution uh, in the coming century that's going to define it for generations to come. Well, you certainly take some wild risks on some things. I have to say, personally, I never thought about putting Tabasco sauce in brownies, George. Well, when I saw the Tabasco seasoned chocolates on the the counter of uh, of the store that I went into, uh, and it's sold by Tabasco brand, uh, light bulbs went off. I said, this has got to be baked into a brownie. Uh, and it's an extremely popular dish, a downloaded recipe on the website as well as in the cookbook. Well, George, I just have to say congratulations on this beautiful book 
and on the incredible work that you do every day, innovating while preserving tradition all at the same time. It, it's an honor to have this chance to talk with you, and thank you so much for sitting down with us. It's a pleasure to be with you, and it's equally a pleasure uh, to really tell the stories of, of our Cajun Creole culinary culture. That was George Graham, blogger and author of Acadiana Table. If you enjoyed this Louisiana Eats Quick Bite, you'll find a link in today's show notes to George's website. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you won't miss a delicious upcoming serving of Louisiana Eats. Visit poppytooker.com for lots more recipes and delicious food ideas, too. Have a special request or a thought to share? We'd love to hear from you. Call 504-867-9128 or send us an email to louisianaeats at poppytooker.com. Louisiana Eats original theme music composed by David Pomerlo and performed by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. Thanks to Joe Schreiner who produced this podcast. I'm Poppy Tooker. Thanks for listening. And thanks to our major sponsors, Camellia Brand Beans, Zatarans, Rouse's Markets, and the Ralph Brennan Restaurant Group. Visit poppytooker.com to see a full list of our partners. This Louisiana Eats Quick Bite was produced by Poppy Tooker Broadcasting. Mm-hmm.